Friends, it's my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce our keynoter this morning, Father Virgilio Elizondo, well known to many of us, of course. Father Virgilio is a priest of the Archdiocese of San Antonio. He is professor of pastoral and Hispanic theology here at the University of Notre Dame. He's also a fellow of the Institute for Latino Studies and of the Kellogg Institute. And perhaps his greatest honor, he's a member of the advisory board of the Martin program. <laughs> father Virgilio has been described as the father of U.S. Latino theology, and rightly so. Allow me to mention a few of his many books and writings. Galilean Journey, The Mexican-American Promise, now in its eighth edition. The Future is Mestizo, Life Where Cultures Meet, now in its sixth edition. Guadalupe, Mother of the New Creation, which went to its third edition within the first year of its publication. There are many others and too many articles to mention here. Father Virgilio was also the 1997 winner of the Leitare Medal, the highest award given by the University of Notre Dame. I'm pleased to call him not only a colleague, but a friend and a mentor. Please welcome Father Virgilio Elizondo. Thank you, Mike. It's really good to be with you and to be I think I should be listening to all of you rather than speaking. We heard about conversation last night, and there's so much talent in this room that I, I feel just privileged to be amongst you and to be listening to you. But they've asked me to speak this morning, so I will try. And I'd like to thank Father Mike for the confidence he placed in me. I'm on the committee, but I didn't pick my own name. I, I thought he should be given an address. You should hear him preach. He's one of our best preachers here. And so I want to thank the committee for inviting me and all of you for being here. I think preaching, as all of you I'm sure believe, is at the foundation of the church. Really, there's no other more important activity than preaching the word of God. That's foundational. Well, that's foundational, and it's in the sermon that we touch most people. Uh, but what is the sermon and what is the preaching that we give out? Because I'd like to date, Father asked me to speak about the Virgen de Guadalupe, as mother and, and a model, an icon of evangelization. How does that really give us a, a model, a model that we can somewhat imitate in different ways in our society? And I'd like to just begin by telling you my own story, my own personal story. I grew up in a very Mexican parish in the USA. Uh, we only spoke Spanish, we had very good liturgies, we had, in fact, it was fun to go to church. We didn't need a commandment that should go to keep holy the Lord's day, because that's the day we enjoyed the most. Uh, so we enjoyed going to church, and, and certainly our leader, Guadalupe, was at the center of it. And the festivities around Guadalupe were always exciting. They were early in the morning, we had to get up early, we had the singing, the mañanitas, the tamaladas, all the things that went along with it. It was a joyous event. It was a joyous event of new beginning, before sunrise. Uh, I never heard of the sunrise service before, but it, it was the sunrise service for us. And so it was a fascinating event. And as time went on, as I became a prisoner, I started to realize the, the, the power of Guadalupe. I mean, it was incredible. I remember one story I heard many years later. I was in Seattle, Washington, and I was giving a workshop for the Spanish speaking. And the priest asked me, said, would you mind speaking to the English speaking community? Because they know nothing about Our Lady of Guadalupe, except that I put an image of her there for the Mexican people. And they know she's very important to them, but she has no meaning for them. So would you mind giving a talk about it? So I did, I gave my basic Guadalupe talk, 101. Uh, and at the end of the talk, this family came up to me, uh, the man, the women, and three children. He said, Father, we'd like to tell you a story. He says, once we were in a very, very serious car accident, and my wife got broadsided, and she, com she was completely passed out. We took her to the emergency room, and the doctor said she would be in a coma for the rest of her life that she would not come on, she would be a vegetable, and so forth and so on. And then he turns to her and says, now you tell the rest of the story. 
So he said, well, that's right. He says, I, I blanked out. I don't remember anything. But then in my dream, in my dream state, I saw this lady, Guadalupe, come to me, sit next to the bed, to the bed with me, set me up, uh, and asked, told me, wake up, your family needs you. And at that moment, I came out of the dream. Says, I've been preaching Guadalupe ever since, what she did for me. Uh, and there are many stories like that. But I'll tell you one funny one. During the first Iraq war, uh, this couple came to me, and they wanted me to, to bless their Guadalupe tattoo. <laughs> I had never blessed that tattoo before. <laughs> I looked up in the book, you know, I couldn't find any blessing. <laughs> Couldn't find a blessing for tattoos, <laughs> and I asked him, you know, what, would, you know, would you rather have a medal or a holy card or something? I was being very logical, according to my logic, you know. And they looked at me with a very strange look, like you must be crazy or something, you know. I said, Father, we might lose the medal. We don't want to lose her. So I blessed my first tattoo, and I felt I should have sent it to the Vatican to be included in the book of blessings and got <laughs> and got a stipend for it. <laughs> But anyway, as I started to look into Guadalupe, you know, it's amazing how successful it's been. It's amazing how, how the, it's gone, I really consider it a, a, real, a real event, a major event in church history since Pentecost. Uh, it's brought more Catholics into the church than any other event in history. Uh, and just look at the results, just numbers in space. Uh, she begins amongst the marginal, amongst the poor, the rejected, the subjected, she begins amongst the nobodies, uh, away from the center of anything, the payak. Uh, and she goes and she moves, uh, and she moves consistently from very local devotion, very, very localized, to becoming a world devotion today. I remember going to Nagasaki, Japan, and walking into the church in Nagasaki, and the first thing I saw was Our Lady Guadalupe. And in Paris, France, the chapel is most visited, the most decorated, Our Lady Guadalupe. Uh, in Jerusalem, in two or three places, she's right there. In the Shepherd's Field, in the Dormition of Mary, she's there. In Quebec, Canada, there's a big devotion going to her. In South Africa, they have devotion. So what is it in her? What is it that goes from a very local devotion to a very popular devotion? What is it that, a devotion that went from condemnation? Because the first writings we have on it, Private uh, Arilo Saagun is counseling the missionaries not to have anything to do with it because it's probably a diabolical thing that's happening. So what, what happens go from condemnation uh, to being proclaimed queen, mother of the Americas? So just that aspect alone. But then the cultural penetration, when you see just the way she's penetrated a culture everywhere, she's in art, all kinds of artistic representations, some are controversial. I remember we had one in San Antonio, uh, the big side of a building, this, I think David, Father David might remember it, uh, this artist decided to do a, a Picasso-style image. Well, the people rebelled against it. They were going to burn the building down. The, the bishop had to slow him down. He wasn't promoting it. And people, you say, the bishop had... No, no, it was the people. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, there was an exhibit, had Our Lady in bikini and, and shorts and so forth. The people rebelled against it. Protestants, Catholics, they are going to burn the museum down. But yet, the artistic representations from the beautiful, in the basilica, there's a beautiful painting of her. So the murals, anywhere you go to the murals, you find her present. Uh, in movies, movies and television programs. Uh, television programs at some point might be the worst television series you can imagine, but at some key point, they'll be praying to Our Lady. Uh, so she's promoted plays, plays and even operas. Uh, it's incredible. Names of persons. People are named Guadalupe, names of parks, names of cities, Guadalupe. Uh, and so, again, you find her in tattoos, in songs, in poems, in buses, in taxis, uh, in bars, in restaurants, everywhere. Culture, she's completely permitted to culture. She's led the movements. She was the main leader of the, uh, of the Father Hidalgo movement for the independence of Mexico. Uh, so she, she, led, she led the war, she led the peasants into it. Uh, and she led Cesar Chavez. Some of you might remember the Cesar Chavez campaign where everybody said it was impossible. And yet she, she was the banner. And behind her banner, we had Jews and atheists and Baptists and everybody else uh, singing songs to Our Lady. So what is it in here? Religiously, uh, the popular faith of the people. There is nothing that has excited the people more, even today, 
than the faith in Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe. Uh, nuestra Madre, Nuestra Madrecita, Nuestra Madre Querida. Uh, it comes from the people, from the heart of the people, uh, from the heart of the people. And therefore, their feast days, uh, the feast day processions to her, pilgrimages, pilgrimages. The site of Tepeyac has at least 13 to 15 million pilgrims every year. Uh, they go to stand before her image and receive her blessings. Uh, hymns to her, sermons. You can study the sermons and they're beautiful. We had a course here, a graduate course, a doctoral level course, totally dedicated to Our Lady Guadalupe. And one of the students traced the image of God in the Guadalupe sermons. And it's fascinating uh, because from the beginning, Theological reflection. What is the meaning? He said a major event, salvation histories, an apparition. What is the meaning of what Lupe? And so the, 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 the novenas, the sermons, theological works, medals, ex votos, promesas, uh, churches named in her honor, shrines, religious communities. He's, uh, but you know, it's not a dogma. It's not a dogma that has to be believed. And I think that's what's so beautiful. It's not a dogma that has to be believed, but it's a beautiful gift of God's grace. Uh, it's a beautiful gift uh, of the grace of God. I was given a conference one time at Yale on Our Lady Guadalupe, and at the end of the talk, the stu some students came up to me, uh, very nice students, and they, very courteous, very respectful. They said, Father, you know, uh, we like to talk to us, but wouldn't you agree that only Christ is necessary for salvation? I say, yeah, you're correct. And that's why you're wrong, because you're correct. <laughs> Only Christ is necessary, but that's what makes Guadalupe so special. She's not necessary. Uh, it's like the gift that you have somebody gives you. Uh, you say, no, you don't have to give me that. Uh, a little souvenir you carry in your wallet or something. It wasn't necessary, but it's very precious to you. Uh, it's very precious because to you it's a sign of life. Uh, and this Guadalupe for us, uh, it's, it has ultimate possibilities for theological reflection. I think across the centuries we've been reflecting on it theologically. And I think all of this, all of this led the, the Synodal Fathers in 1999 and the Synod of the Americas to propose to the Pope and include it in the famous uh, uh, apostolic exhortation, uh, Ecclesia in America. And I'll, I'll quote, Holy Mary of Guadalupe is invoked as patroness of all America and as the star of the first and the new evangelization. In this view, I welcome with joy the proposal of the Synod Fathers that the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mother and Evangelizer of America be celebrated throughout. Uh, she, uh, this, this was then the conclusion of the Synod Fathers. So what is it in Guadalupe? Let me give you a little background uh, about the, the moment the moment that it happened, last night we heard about the importance of contextualizing, contextualizing the doctrine of the church. Well, it was important to contextualize uh, Our Lady and the apparitions. First of all, the moment it happened, it was really the moment of crucifixion. Uh, it was really the moment when, when the native peoples were suffering collectively a crucifixion. Uh, their gods had died, their men, their warriors had been killed, their women had been raped, their cities had been burned, and they would say, if, this is, if our gods have abandoned us, why should we live? Let us die. Uh, it was really a moment of a collective death wish. Uh, and it was a world that was very, very different, very, very different from the European world, very, very different from the Western world. Uh, had a totally different anthropology. Uh, had a to Let me just give you a few highlights that I think are very important to understand it. They had a tremendous sense of duality, not dualism, but duality. Uh, there is no such thing in native thought as true or false. Uh, things are true and they are false at the same time. There is night in day and day in night. There is beauty in ugliness, ugliness in beauty. There is sadness in joy, in joy in sadness. Uh, they had a concept of duality. God is male, female. Because how could God be God if God was only male? How could it be? It would be half God. So God was male and female. All of this duality, uh, you are feminine and masculine in both to different degrees. And to express this, they had a system of disfrasismos, uh, where every truth was explained, was expressed in two visual terms. No one term could express the truth. For example, how would you say person or personality? 
the countenance and the heart, uh, rostro y corazón. Uh, how would you say, for example, that some, this uh, revelation that God speaks, flower and song, uh, beauty that is seen, beauty that is heard, beauty. Uh, it was through beauty that we entered the reality of God. Uh, truth, ultimate truth, could only be expressed poetically because the poem opens the mind to the beyond. Uh, rational thought, the way we have it, limits it. It's this and nothing else. The poetic mind opens you up by suggestion, by imagery. Uh, and so they, they had a good sense of the truth through beauty that is seen and beauty that is heard. They, had a, they were very, very literate, but they were not alphabetic. They were pictographic. Uh, the image told the message. Uh, and you can see some of the historical documents of ancient Mexico. They are totally image-wise. There's one that was discovered a few years ago in, in southern Mexico. Uh, it's a map of, of the history, about 400-year four, history. It's about this big, uh, and it, it had every little detail is in it. It took scientists, uh, human scientists, took them about 10 years working together to try to decipher what's in this document. They were very, very literate, but they were not alphabetic. Uh, and, the, and the pictorial mind has a different logic. Uh, the alphabetic mind goes from the detail, uh, from the letter to the word to the sentence, to the paragraph, to the chapter, to the book. Uh, the pictographic mind sees the whole thing and then sees relationships. Uh, and, and so th this was, and for them, the temple, the temple was the, was the center of society. The temple was symbolic of the way of life. It wasn't just a building. Uh, but for them, God, God could not be contained in a building. It wouldn't be God. Uh, and so the, the, their pyramids went up to the beyond because God was everywhere. Uh, and so in a way, the, the, the temple was symbolic of all this. Now, this was the mindset of the people, totally different from the European mindset. Into this comes the conquest, the conquest and evangelization. Uh, the conquest, there's no way around it. It was brutal. It was brutal, it was cruel, it, it was horrible. But alongside the conquest came the missionaries. And that was a different school. Uh, that was, it was the beginning. It was the beginning of the Reformation before the Reformation in Europe. It was the Refor biblical Reformation of Cardinal Francisco de Cisneros, who already had insisted on renewing the church by going directly to the Gospels. Uh, it was an evangelical renewal. Uh, it was a evangelical renewal. He was very excited about really, in the Americas now, in the new land, a completely new church could be born. A completely new church that would learn from the mistakes of the Church of Europe. In fact, in his mind, the Church of Europe was finished. Uh, the Church of Europe had, had no future. It was now in this place. One of the graphs that he had painted has the, the, the 12 Franciscans that came over, on, carrying on their shoulders, carrying on the shoulders, I don't know how you call it in English, the Andas, uh, carrying on the shoulders, the Vatican. Because the Vatican was finished, it would be not transposed to this land. Uh, so, so Cardinal Sinod had a great love for the Bible and for the image of the Bible and for the dynamics of the Bible. Along came the 12 missionaries, but the one that had the most impact in the evangelization was Peter of Gant, Pedro de Gant, a Franciscan lay brother who didn't have time for ordination because ordination would take, he would have to waste, quote, waste time saying mass and the breviary and all this stuff. He had work to do. And he started, he started by just for two or three years just getting lost with the children, just playing with the children, uh, just playing with them. And he was being reborn into the Indian world. Uh, so he could understand it from within. Uh, so he, now he's the one that really became the main evangelizer of Mexico. And the evangelization was holistic. Uh, uh, he, uh, it was, first of all, he went to the symbolic level. The symbolic level, the, the temple was the center of life for the natives. Uh, and the temple was what attracted people. And the temple had a sense of beauty to it. So the new churches, the churches of the new world, had to be the churches according to the temple, what do you think, of the prophet Ezekiel. Because the prophet Ezekiel wrote about the restoration of the new temple. Uh, and so that was the model for the churches, the single nave models with a beautiful courtyard around it. Because as you walked into the church, you had to have a sense of paradise, uh, that you're coming, and they had to have a sense of beauty, uh, a beautiful church. They would replace the Actepetels, which were the nave temples. But then also the symbolic level, the toughest thing for the missionaries to understand, and I think it would be for me, uh, human sacrifice. 
I mean, human sacrifice, for, for the natives, human sacrifice was offered because they believe in the survival of life. Uh, and they believe that you had to, just like we are nourished by the animals below us, by eating meat, and the animals are nourished by the insects and so forth, we have to nourish the divine. Uh, we have to nourish the ultimate. And so human sacrifice was a nourishment of the gods. It was considered a privilege. But it was still awesome for the Spaniards. Uh, but the way, on, the way human on the way human life was taken was the mutual scandal of both groups. Uh, the Spaniards were scandalized by the human sacrifice of the natives. The natives were scandalized at the lack of respect for life of the Spaniards they would kill so easily without concern. So on the basis of how life was taken, uh, both scandalized each other. Uh, but the missionaries capitalized on this. They capitalized on the human sacrifice of saying, look, you are doing great things. But now the time has come when one has offered his life, one who was a divine human being. Uh, one has offered his life for all of us. So the cross becomes the key symbol of the evangelization. Uh, the cross with all the symbols, uh, with, the, with, with the nails, the crown of thorns, the whip, and it was that, those crucifixes were placed on, on the act of petals, uh, on the stone of sacrifice. So show now there's a sacrifice that expressed all the sacrifices, and that's the Son of God. So he went to symbolic and rituals. He organized many rituals which are still in use today. Rituals were very participatory. Uh, the very participatory rituals, Good Friday around Navidad, around, around Christmas time, uh, around Corpus Christi, around uh, Day of los Muertos, Day of the Dead. All of this had really participatory rituals. Why? Because the scriptures were based on events. And if you had never heard of, if you never knew about the event, you could not understand what they're talking about. So you had to, in a way, ritually bring the people and to participate in the event. And we had pastorelas, we had posadas, we had all kinds of things. The visual, they realized the visual. And so, again, muralist, Pedro de Gaan brought in some of the best artists from, from uh, Belgium and, Fran and, and Holland to, to, to work with the natives with their style of art and to produce a new artwork uh, that they could see the truth. And musically, they developed very beautiful. The music came out of the, out of the standard cantos del pueblo, alabados del pueblo. They came from me. All these efforts were fascinating, but they seemed to have failed. They seemed to have failed because at the end of the first 10 years, with great efforts, they're hardly making any converts. Uh, yet I believe in God's providence, it was they in the foundation. Because the missionaries kept praying, kept praying for divine intervention. And finally, it happened. On December of 1531, the conquest took place in 1521. And in 1531, Our Lady appeared. Uh, keep in mind, at the darkest moment, at the darkest, most painful moment of Mexican history, uh, the brightest light came forth. Uh, just like at the crucifixion and resurrection. At the crucifixion was the darkest moment, the hour of darkness of the world, according to John. And at the hour of darkness, equally the hour of glory. And so here was this moment of, of physical death, a, a collective crucifixion of a people. But into this now comes the Our Lady of Guadalupe. We don't know exactly what happened. We know something happened. We don't know exactly what. There was no video cameras. There was no photographs taken and so forth. We don't know. But we had a poetic memory. And we have, for people for whom oral tradition was very important, the poetic memory is very important. Just like the Gospels were written out of the memory of Christians. Uh, and that's why it can vary because they remembered an event or events and they put them together. So it, the narrative that we have today is the narrative of the event put together in the collective memory of the people in, uh, in a poetic way in the Indian language of poetry. And so what is it? Let me just give you a few synthesis of, uh, first of all, the narrative begins. There's always a binomial there. It begins while it's still dark. Juan Diego is, leaves his home while it's still dark. It's the darkness of the soul for whom everybody has finished. It's the darkness of people that have no hope. It's the darkness of the end of a life. In the Indian mythology, uh, while it's still dark, is the final moment of the liberation of the gods between, before creation takes place. So in a way, it's a creation story. 
but it's also a story about the depth of the pain of that moment of the native world. But when you arrive at Tepeyac, that's the hill of Our Lady, it begins to dawn. Uh, it begins to dawn. And again, that's a sign of new life. Uh, that new life is beginning. And so he, and when he gets to the, uh, when he gets to the hill, far away from Mexico City, far away from the center of power and control, uh, out in the outskirts where nobody lives, uh, where the poor Indians live, uh, he's invited by beautiful music. Uh, not the threats of missionaries, not the fact that you have to believe. No, he hears beautiful music. Uh, and the beautiful music is so beautiful that he's attracted to it, uh, that he's attracted to the music. And he hears the birds, and he names the birds. And the birds are considered the messengers of God. So he hears, in a way, he hears the voice of God. Uh, and it's calling him. It's calling him. Uh, the music attracts him to go to the top of the hill. Now keep in mind, who used to go to the top of the hill? The Indian priests. And they used to go to the top of the hill to offer human sacrifice. But he's called by beautiful music. And there in the top of the hill, he sees the lady that is so beautiful, she radiates the sun. Uh, she radiates life. Uh, and, he, and it's all excited. She, she calls him by name. Uh, and in her presence, in her presence, everything becomes transformed. In her presence, everything takes on a new look. Uh, everything becomes now beautiful, like diamonds and emeralds and pearls and all kinds of precious jewels. He's in her presence. Uh, but in her presence, he stands. He doesn't even kneel. There's an equality. Uh, and she refers to him as, uh, as my, my most abandoned son, my most dignified son. Uh, always two terms. But look, at she affirmed the reality he's living, my most abandoned. Uh, he had been abandoned by the gods. The people said he was, they weren't sure he was human. Debates were going on in Spain at that time about the humanity of the Indians. But she affirms it, and she calls him my son, my beloved son, my dignified son. Uh, so the way she treats him is beautiful. And, and then she begins to identify herself. I think one of the most beautiful texts uh, in the narrative is in paragraph 22, when she identifies herself as, as the Virgin Mary, Mary, Mother of God. But she's also the mother of the native gods. She's the mother of all. Uh, and she's the mother, she begins by saying, I am the mother of the true God through whom one lives, the mother of Teotl, uh, the a God of person, the God of the near and far away. She combines the names of gods uh, into one. She's the mother of all of them. A tremendous ecumenical text, a tremendous interreligious text uh, that she's, she's affirming that she's God. But she does not appeal to the gods that demanded human sacrifice. Uh, here, in a way, begins the purification. Uh, she, she doesn't refer to the god of punishment and justice. She refers to, to god of life. Uh, so she, in a way, beginning here the purification, because in a way, the Christianity that was come over that time was just totally fascinated, if you want, obsessed, might be a better word, obsessed with punishment, uh, that god that God was the God of judge. It was the God the Father who was, who was merciful, but who judged and would condemn you to hell and to purgatory. In fact, one of the biggest challenges of the missionaries was to, to convince the Indians there was such a thing as purgatory uh, because the Indians had no concept of punishment in the afterlife. Uh, they could not understand this. And so they devised very creatively something that would be very horrible today or any time, and they would get big cauldrons big cauldron, fill them with oil, and then get the oil to boil. Now, you know, oil boils at a much hotter temperature than water. So they get this boiling oil, and then into it, they would throw life animals. And when the animals would go, ah, that's going to happen to you. But they, they, were, they were obsessed with punishment. There's no punishment here. There's no punishment at all in the lady. She refers to the gods of life. And then she gives her intention. She came to remedy, to remedy the ills, to be the compassionate mother, to be the merciful mother, to be the mother who could express all her love for all the children who live in these lands. Notice, not just the children of Mexico. Uh, uh, she appears in the center, in the center of, of the continent, but, but she appears to be the mother of all who would believe in her, all who revere her, all who look up to her. Uh, she's, a, she's a loving mother to all of us. And so that is her wish, that Juan Diego is to go to the bishop. Uh, 
I mean, here's the, re the beginning of the reversal. Uh, Juan Diego, who's a poor Indian, the Machuwal Indian, the man of the people, uh, man of the ground, man of the earth, well, he used to go to the palace of the bishop. And Juan Diego argues with him in a way. He says, lady, I'm not accustomed to going to such places. You know, I'm not used to going to those places. But he, she said, go. And he goes full of joy, full of life. Uh, the lady has restored him already. Uh, by calling him by name, by confiding in him, uh, confiding in him, she believes in him, and she sends him. So he goes full of life and joy. Uh, and of course, he goes to the bishop, and you can't blame the bishop on this for not receiving him, for not receiving him well. Uh, I mean, I was pastor of the cathedral for 12 years, and I had many apparitions reported to me. And what do you think I told them? <laughs> well, pray, you know, pray for it, see what happens, you know. I mean, you can blame the bishop. For, but anyway, the, the second, Juan Diego, after he's turned away, he comes back to the lady, and this is a very sad but real part of the story. Uh, wh when the one is always a subjected people, a dominated people, a conquered people, when they're not believed, then it reaffirms, that reaffirms a lie of the one that conquered them, that they are not even human. They are not to be believed. Huh? And Juan Diego comes to the lady and he prostrates himself and he begins to blame himself. He begins to blame himself for it. That I, that, you know, lady, send somebody more important. Send somebody that, that's a notable, that's, send, some, send a bishop, a theologian, an intellectual. Send somebody that's recognized because I'm nothing. I'm worse than a pile of leaves. And you know what leaves were used for? Toilet paper. Huh? I'm worse than the excrement of people. I mean, it was nothing. Huh? So he, in a way, he's expressing the deep feeling of people that had been a proud people, but had been conquered and totally subjugated and pulled down. Huh? And the, the response of the lady is just marvelous. He said, my son, I have many ambassadors that I could pick from, but it's in every way precise. It's in every way essential that you, the smallest of my children, be my trusted ambassador. Uh, those are her words. He, to be her trust, and he's to go to the bishop again and tell him the story. And of course, he goes to the bishop, tells him the story again, and the bishop this time asks him for a sign. And to the bishop's surprise, he says, what do you want? You know? And he goes back and tells the lady, and the lady tells him to come back the next morning. But then the little story, his uncle, Juan Bernardino, sick, and he decides he's got to go first and get a priest to help his dying uncle. He comes back. He goes to the other side of the hill, you know, and the lady comes and meets him. He says, don't worry. Your uncle will not die of this disease. Now go up to the top of the hill. Go up to the top of the hill, and there you will find the sign. So he climbs the hill, and he finds, in December, beautiful flowers from Castile. Uh, notice the symbolism because the words are very precise here. He finds beautiful flowers in a time and a zone which was not given to flowers, uh, where there were no flowers. Uh, but the flowers, the beautiful flowers, were from Castile, from Spain. Uh, here's now the, the blossoming of the faith, uh, because the missionaries came from Spain. Uh, they were sent by the church in Spain. Uh, that's where they came from. They had the seeds of the gospel. But the gospel now is implanted in the native soil. Uh, the gospel viene de la tierra, de lo más profundo de la tierra de, del pueblo, uh, so in the corazón del pueblo. Now, it's, the gospel comes forth as the seed that came forth from, from the native ground. Uh, and so you have the flowers now. They become the symbol and the, and the reality. And notice it, the, 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 almost the sandwiched in. It begins with beautiful music. It ends with flowers. Song, flor y canto, flower and song. It's not, when we call out the book at the end of the reading, say the word of God, uh, this is placed within the context of the word of God. Uh, and of course, when he gets to the bishop and he drops his tilma, the image appears on the tilma. The beautiful image appears on the tilma. And the bishop now uh, repents, uh, asks for forgiveness, believes in it, and he goes now from the center of power to Tepeyac, to the periphery. Uh, the bishop now, the church, is listening to the voice of the poor. Uh, and the church is going out, just like our Holy Father is doing today, just like our Holy Father is doing to the peripheries of society, 
to the peripheries of all who are anything, to the jails and the homes for the deformed and the, and the Lampulisa when he went to the immigrants. Uh, and I hear rumors if he comes to the States, I've heard rumors that he will probably go to the border because that's where the, that's where the greatest suffering is in the States. In fact, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's a good rumor. Uh, maybe he'll hear it and come. Uh, uh, so anyway, but, but it, it, this is now the new church. Uh, the new church that, that together, because notice in the dynamics of it, Juan Diego is not asked to build a temple. He's asked to go to the bishop. But the bishop is asked to listen to Juan Diego. So it's a partnership. It's a partnership uh, that together they're going to build the church. Uh, and together they're going to build a temple. And I'm convinced, my dear friends, the temple that Our Lady was asking for has not yet been built. I'm convinced the temple that she was asking for, where she can call all her love, mercy, compassion, and so forth, for all the people of this land. I'm convinced the temple Our Lady is asking for is a temple of an America without borders. I don't know how it will happen. I'm not a politician, I'm not an economist, but I'm convinced that that's the mandate of the Virgin, uh, that this is going to truly be a new land where the hatreds of the old will no longer be here, where the hatreds and the prejudices of the old will no longer be here, but where peoples of all the world can come and be here as brother and sister. I'm convinced that's the temple that she wanted because that's the temple that she started by bringing together the Indian and the Spaniard and the Mestizo people into a new unity, uh, into a new unity. That was the beginning. The new church was born in Tepeyac. And the healing of the uncle, Juan Bernardino, was the assurance that the heritage would continue. So that, my friend, is the, the event and the story. Now, the image itself, you know, the image itself is, is a pictographic. Uh, it's a pictographic image. I think some of you know it already. It's, I'll just give you a simple reading of it. As you see the image, you see the sun all behind her. Uh, so it could mean one or two things, or maybe two things at once. Uh, once, she, as great as the sun God is, she's greater than the sun God uh, because she covers the sun. But the other one is that the sun is protecting her. Uh, she's in, involved with, she's in, involved in the sun. And so the sun is giving her protection. Uh, but either way, she's greater than the sun. She's standing upon the moon goddess, but just and destroyed, uh, the two greatest gods. Uh, but she who's standing upon the, uh, who's greater than her gods is not herself a goddess uh, because she has a beautiful face. She has a beautiful face that sees, that looks at you and has eyes that see. I'm convinced that today, today the, great, the greatest power of Guadalupe is in her eyes. You know, they say that if you look carefully, you can see Juan Diego reflected in the eye of Our Lady. Well, I think there is an image there, but I'm convinced that the image that you see today, uh, the, the image today be in her eye, you know, how do we see ourselves in the eye of the other? You know, and we see ourselves as respected, as accepted, as loved, and so forth. That gives us life. Uh, that gives us life. And I'm sure that wh the one that is in her image today is the person looking at her. I once had a, I was doing a television series, and we were at, uh, we were at the Basilica. And I, and I was so impressed with the people going by on the mechanical sidewalk, which I hate, but it's very practical, uh, as they were going through. And each one had a moment with Our Lady. Uh, and we would see their eyes, just the, the look in their eyes was like looking at two, uh, two sons. Just the, it was beautiful to see simple people, rich people, powerful people, powerless people, just anybody. And that moment totally transfixed, just a second or two. Uh, and I wanted to film that. And I got permission after I gave a few monies to their favorite charities. <laughs> I got permission to put a camera that nobody could see and, and to get it right in there and to get their pictures. And then I was about to shoot those pictures when all of a sudden I had the, the insight that I couldn't dare intrude on that moment of intimacy, that that would have been wrong. It would be like intruding on a married couple in the midst of her, of her sexual union to say to show what intimacy is about. You know, I didn't dare, so I didn't shoot it. I, didn't shoot, I just left it in the memory. But it, it's beautiful uh, because if people see themselves in the eye, in the eye of our lady. And so she has eyes that see, she has a face that sees. Uh, uh, she's, a, she's heavenly because she's clothed with the, with the blue-green, uh, the mantle of divinity. Uh, and so she's heavenly in the picture. She shares in the divine. But she's also earthly because of her dress. Uh, the earth is the, earth of, of, uh, the color of earth. 
Uh, and so she's heavenly, but she's earthly. Uh, she's in a position of offering, uh, because this is a position uh, not so much of prayer, but offering the heart. Uh, I offer my heart to you. Uh, and it, this is the position Our Lady has now. She's offering herself to us. And what she's offering herself is what she has in her, in her womb. Uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe Pierce is pregnant. Uh, the beginning of Christianity in America. She wears the black band of maternity. In Spanish, when somebody's pregnant, we say, está encinta. Uh, she's wearing the band. But, you know, again, something very interesting. Um, several years ago, NASA asked permission to do a photographic study of Our Lady. And then they came to us in San Antonio would we help them with the interpretation of it. And they were going to different things because they, you know, it's very evident it's been retouched a few times. Uh, but you can get to the original image, which is there, the original. Uh, and, and so, it, it, you know, so they're talking about the different aspects. I mentioned the fact that she was pregnant, that she had the band of maternity. And they all kind of started giggling a bit. You know, and that makes you kind of nervous when you say something and the audience begins kind of giggling in a doubtful way. So uh, I said, well, what, what's wrong? He says, well, there was one element of the study that we're not going to reveal because we didn't want to hurt Catholic sensitivities. So the fact is that in, in the painting, her sheiks are the sheiks of a woman is third month of pregnancy. Uh, so that also revealed. You can tell from the image, you can tell from the image she's a virgin, and mother. Now you can tell from the motherhood very easily. Uh, from the waistband, she wears the, the band of maternity. How can you tell she's a virgin? By her hairdo. Uh, hairdos are very carefully regulated. And she has the hair of a young maiden who is considered to be a virgin. So in the very image, in the very image, she presents herself as virgen y madre, virgin and, and mother. So th this is then the image. Uh, her eyes, her hands, her leg, her leg is kind of a little bit up. She's dancing. She's a dancing virgin. Uh, she's a dancing because that was the native way of prayer uh, to elevate the whole person to God, the whole person to God. And she has the, uh, the eyes to see, the hands, the leg, so, and the four-leaf clover over her womb. The four-leaf is the only one you find in the whole painting, which is a symbol of the, of the fifth son is the fifth son is now in her, so she becomes a mother. She was identified as the mother of our Lord and Savior by Juan Diego. She never says she is, but it's Juan Diego who identifies her as the mother of our Lord and Savior. I think when we look at her and we try to interpret it, uh, what are the things in it? First of all, it's um, very culturally respectful. It's amazing the way the, 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 the poetic memory is so respectful of the native culture that was totally subdued at that time. Uh, and, and the natives have believed in themselves. Uh, so it, it's a belief, it's a belief in them. It's a respect for the culture. It's a, it's a deeply anchored in respect for the culture and acceptance and even, even a, a love of the culture. Uh, this is very precedent. But there's also the fact of that Juan Diego is called to be human, uh, is the call to be fully human. Uh, he's not an underdeveloped, he's not a savage, he's not backwards, he's not all the stereotypes that are beginning to come in about the Indian. The Indian has a voice. Uh, the poor, the subjugated, the oppressed have a voice. And it's a voice that gives him dignity. When you call someone by name in a respectful way, you are affirming their human dignity. We well, don't call them just in, oh, Indios, Indios, no. Juan Diego, Juan Bernardino, a name, a dignity of a person. And that is profound. One of the greatest moments of suffering of a lot of our immigrants is when they're treated worse than dogs. And they'll tell you this. When they're treated worse than dogs or cats. And that's the greatest suffering, not crossing the desert, not trying to come across the river, but when they're treated in a subhuman way. And so here you have the opposite. Here you have Juan Diego, who was, had been crushed by, by the conquista, who's elevated, uh, who's elevated. And this, I think, is, a, is our way with every person. I find in working in the cathedral, there was nothing more powerful than just befriending, befriending the sim simple people in the street. I remember one fellow in particular, um, by human standards, by human standards, uh, he was quite ugly. 
And he stopped me on the street one time and said, Father, could I have a, those days you could still get a beer for a dollar. Could I have a dollar for beer? And I said, I'm going to tell you the truth, Father. I'm so ugly, nobody likes to talk to me. People walk away from when I ask them stuff. But I just want to calm myself a bit, so I'm not going to lie to you. I just want a dollar for beer. So I said, no, I'm not going to give you any money. But I'll take you across and have a beer with you. So we went across to a bar and had a beer with him. I mean, he felt great. Um, simply, I had accepted him as a human being. Uh, my dear friend, that, that is the beginning, uh, to accept people and to, and to work with them. Uh, but it's also an invitation. It was an invitation to a conversion. Uh, it was an invitation to a new way of life because Christianity had brought in something new. Uh, it, would, it would be joined with what was there, but it would offer a new vision of itself. Uh, it would offer a new understanding, a, a, a new possibility uh, to bring out good, to bring out the good and beautiful out of both worlds. Uh, this was the purpose of Our Lady. Uh, and so yet as respectful as it was, as it affirming of human dignity, it was also transformative. It was also transformative because, again, Juan Diego is transformed, Juan Bernardino is healed, and the culture is healed, and the people began to sing songs. They were depressed people, and now you can see a new people. They began to sing songs, they began to have festivals, they began to rise in hope and joy and life. Uh, so the whole people have been transformed from a dying people to a living people. And this would take time. This would take time across it. It, it wasn't just overnight. Uh, it would take time, but it goes on even to this day. Uh, it, it was cleansing. It was cleansing of both religions, and that was, I think, the most beautiful part. It cleansed the old religions of their need for human sacrifice, but it cleansed the Christian faith historically at that moment of an overemphasis with hell, fire, and damnation. God is the God of mercy. God is the God of rehabilitation. God is the God of love. God is the love of beauty. God is the love of joy. God is the love of life. Uh, and so we restored both religions and started a new religion of the to come together. Uh, so it brings, and also it brought the native people into universal culture, the universal family of God's children. Uh, this is the real Catholicity of Catholicism. Uh, they bring it into the fold of diversity as part of the unity, not making them the same as us, but bring them in as part of the unity. Uh, and so this is the unity in diversity. Uh, and it brings in, uh, it expands the unity of the people. And so all things in a way that this really our theology of enculturation. Now, what, what can we learn today? What can we learn today from the new evangelization? First of all, can we listen to the voice of the poor? Can we listen to the voice of the marginal, of the immigrant? I mean, today is, I think today, I think the major issue facing us, and I know people are trying to do something about it, but it's a lot of obstacles. How about the 40,000 immigrant children that have crossed the border in these days from Central America? I think that's a major issue, and I think we are trying. We're trying, I know in our diocese, our archbishop is really trying to run into all kinds of obstacles, but I think that's a voice that has to be heard. The children that are crying, that are daring to come across Mexico because of the violence in, in Central America. Are we listening to those cries of the poor? Are we listening to the beggars we have all over the place? Are we listening to their voices? Are we listening to the, the spice of society? Are, are we listening to them and are we calling them by name? Because that's the beginning of the conversation. Uh, that's the beginning of the conversation, to call them by name. Uh, but what do it mean for us to be culturally respectful in our growing multicultural society. In our growing multicultural society has different customs, different views, different languages. What, what would it mean for us? And I, I think we can learn how to be respectful. And I think the key, the key is always unlimited love. Unlimited love would lead you to understanding. Unlimited love would lead you to new areas of understanding that you don't even suspect possible. Uh, but when you really love someone, you want to understand them so you can love them more. It's like a, like a spiral of growth. Because you love, you seek to understand. Because you understand, you love even more. Uh, and, and so that is the, what we need to get into, the, this culture, the transformative culture based on love. Uh, and how can, we imit how can we initiate and carry on the conversation? We heard last night of the importance of conversation. How can we initiate it and carry it on? 
uh, because Guadalupe was an event that, that begins but it expands and it continues to happen. Uh, it, con it didn't just happen at once. It was those events that, that gave rise to a movement, that gave rise to a life, that gave rise to an energy. Uh, and it's that energy that keeps going. So what sort of icon could convey today uh, the power of Guadalupe? And I think really to rediscover, to rediscover that Guadalupe was precisely at the beginning of the so-called new world. Uh, and to appreciate more and more what new world really means. Uh, to appreciate it, and let me give you an example. I was given a conference in, in France some time ago to an uh, inter-university program. And I spoke about the reality of, of mestizaje, of bringing different groups together, and not just tolerating, not just tolerating one another, but going beyond toleration to, to acceptance and, and to real love for each other. During the coffee break, this lady comes to me. She was from Bosnia. I remember it very well. And she said, you know, uh, I sort of like what you said. I sort of like what you said, but I'm not sure. Because I've always grown up, I was grown up with the conviction that you only tolerate the other when you're too weak, or too much of a coward to destroy them. Uh, that's a mentality, my dear friends. And that's a mentality of a lot of the old world. Thanks be to God, we don't share that in the new world. Uh, we're a world really who's brought together all the peoples of the world and are still coming in. How can we work together to find a symbol of unity, to find a way of dealing with these differences, uh, but to turn this difference into a harmonious difference, not a splitting difference? I think that's our task. Uh, and that task can come through in our preaching. And our preaching is not just the word of God from the pulpit. It's our whole way of life for the people. Uh, that is the entire sermon. They will forget what you say, but they'll remember you. Somebody just told me this morning, I remember you very well, but I don't remember what you said, you know? <laughs> and that's so true of many of us. Uh, you remember the teacher. A lot of times you forget what they taught you. But you remember because you are the main sermon. Uh, you are the main sermon yourself. In every moment of your life, you're proclaiming the word of God. And so I think today, today, just to remember ourselves, that Our Lady, in the words of the bishops and the Pope, she's the patroness of all America and the star of the first and a new evangelization. She's the star that brought the gospel into the Americas and will lead us in to a new era, to a new era, to a new church, and a new humanity that really encompasses all the peoples of the world and all can experience her love, reconciliation, remedy, and mercy. Thank you very much.